My name's Rob. Hello again. I come, <laughs> come from the village of East Harptree on, yeah, kind of this side of the Mendip Hills, on the, the northern slope, the dark side. I'm just up from the Chew Valley. And coming up to 12 years ago, I was fortunate enough to acquire a hectare of land, which is about two and a half acres. And I've spent all that time transforming it into a forest garden. It wasn't a very popular term a few years ago. People didn't know what I meant by forest garden. It's sometimes the term agroforestry or food forest project. There are lots of different terms. But just like the last two times I've been here, I'm just gonna read a short paragraph, a long paragraph, to describe what a forest garden is before we go on to the animals of the forest garden. So, if you're sitting comfortably, <laughs> I shall begin. Picture yourself in a forest where almost everything around you is food. Mature and maturing fruit and nut trees form an open canopy. If you look carefully, you can see fruits swelling on many branches. Pears, apples, persimmons, pecans and chestnuts. Shrubs fill the gaps in the canopy. They bear raspberries, blueberries, currants, hazelnuts and other lesser known fruits and flowers and other nuts at different times of the year. Assorted native wildflowers, wild edibles, herbs and perennial vegetables thickly cover the ground. You use many of these plants for food or medicine. Some attract beneficial insects, birds or butterflies. Others act as soil builders and some just help keep out the weeds. Here and there, vines climb on trees and shrubs or arbors with fruit hanging through the foliage, hardy kiwis, grapes and passionflower fruits. In sunnier glades, large stands of Jerusalem artichokes grow together with groundnut vines. These plants support one another as they store energy in their roots for later harvest and winter storage. Their bright yellow and deep violet flowers enjoy the radiant warmth from the sky, sometimes. This is an edible forest garden. And I used to say when I did these talks about seven, eight, nine years ago, that that is what the forest garden should look like. But now it's coming into year 12, it more or less does look like that. It's actually working. It's taken a long time to do it, but now that it's reached maturity, all the different plants, well, I used to boast that there were 440 different edible plants, but since getting the geese, that's sort of now about 290. <laughs> but, but we'll come on to the geese. But it's got to the stage where those plants are creating a miniature symbiotic ecosystem on the one hectare, and all the relationships between the plants are working to help each other out, and it's actually more or less self-sustaining with very, very little maintenance. And I used to boast that, oh, it's a maintenance-free garden, but whilst it was being set up, there was actually a lot to do. But now that it is mature, there's very little to do. I mean, I haven't cut the grass since September, so it's looking quite scruffy, but as soon as I mow the paths in the spring, everything else will look in place. I mean, that's my only real element of control over the place, is keeping the grass cut. Because it's a bit like framing a picture, isn't it? If you've got gardens, as soon as you cut the grass, all the messy borders look intentional. It's like horrible abstract art, and as soon as you put a nice frame around it, it looks, it looks okay, or passable. So the forest garden's like that. It's got sneaking networks of, of paths weaving throughout it that makes all the so-called, well, seemingly messy areas look really good. But coming on to the animals, I mean, there are, there are lots of animals in the garden. I mean, to start with, 12 years ago, it was just an open site. It was just a, a hectare of, of grassland. And occasionally a badger trundled through it, and a, sometimes a buzzard swooped over looking for non-existent mice. But over the years, the number of wild species have really built up because it's not just a garden to feed people, but it's also for the wildlife too. It, it sort of ticks all the boxes. And just in the last few years, it now has a, a healthy barn owl population and tawny owls. There are grass snakes, myriad insects. There are field mice and door mice. And because, well, that attracts also the, the um, raptorish birds. Are they raptors? Yeah, the predatory birds. And there are foxes, well, for better or worse. And uh, deer sometimes come in and nibble the trees and rabbits. But the whole place is actually rabbit proof. And that's an important point that you mentioned because in the first year, before planting anything, the, apart from walking around and assessing the site, 
and working where the frost pockets were and where the rain collected and what the soil was like and where the sun moved around so as not to plant anything well, the shade-loving things in the shade and the sun-loving things in the sun. I had to rabbit-proof the whole place, and I have mentioned this in previous years, but I'll mention it again because it's really important. The easiest way of rabbit-proofing a garden is...